And welcome Pastor as he comes to bring the word today. Anybody ever go swimming and somebody was already in the water and then you hear them say, come on in, the water's fine. You ever heard that? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Come on in. The water is fine. In Ezekiel 47, God took Ezekiel the prophet to the house of God. Now tuck this thought away. The blessings of God always start at the house of God. So God took Ezekiel to the house of God. He was going to give him an object lesson. And he showed him coming out of the house of God was just a trickle of water. A very small amount, enough to get a drink. There was a man with a measuring rod showed up. And Ezekiel was told to follow him and follow the water. A man measured a thousand cubits, about 1,800 feet, a third of a mile. And the water that was a trickle at the start was up to his ankles. Another thousand cubits. And the water was up to his knees. Another thousand cubits. And the water was up to Ezekiel's thighs, his, his loins. And another thousand cubits. And it was waters to swim in. Too big to cross. Now take that image. And picture in your mind the church. This church. Let's talk about us. Picture this church. There's some here that are saved. They've had a drink of the water. They've got a trickle of water in their life. There are others who are up to their ankles. Some are up to their knees. Some are up to their loins. And a few are in water deep enough to swim in. If the Apostle Paul was describing it at that point, he would say it was above and beyond all you could ask or think. And then there's another group. And this group, they just stand and look at the trickle. They're not even saved. So out of all of these groups, they all represent it here. And I come in here, Jeremy and Jock, we come in here, we stand at the pulpit, and we scream and holler, Come on in! The water's fine! Don't just stand and look at it. Get wet. Wherever you are in Christ, if you're up to your ankles, or knees, or loins, keep going. Don't stop. The deeper you get, the closer you get to God, and the greater the blessing of God, and the greater God can use you. The blessing of God and growth always start at the house of God. The best, easiest place to get saved is at church. More people get saved in church than they do any other place on the planet. The best place to grow in the grace and knowledge of God is at church. People learn more and grow in a Bible preaching church than all of the other sources put together. More people are saved, lives are changed in a Bible-preaching church than any other place. Every Christian ought to build their life and their family's lives around a Bible-preaching church. Now, I've used that phrase, that prepositional phrase, in a Bible-preaching church three times because I want it stamped on your brain. Jesus was taken to church 
when he was eight days old. When a child is born, he ought to be taught that being in the house of God is important. Young people need to know how important it is to be in the house of God. Parents, you ought to make every effort to have your preteens and teens in the epic on Sunday nights. When Jock was playing, I hate to just use my kids as examples, but he was playing basketball in Seneca. Seneca had never stressed. Their, their main stress in sports was on wrestling. They had great wrestling teams every year. When he started playing basketball down there, nobody went to the game. You'd go, there'd be 15, 20 people in the, in, the, in the gym watching the game. It wasn't long. They started winning. And by his junior and senior year, you had to get there early to find a seat. Building was full. The gym would be full because they were winning. First time in years they had a winning team. Well, they decided for some reason they were going to have practice on Wednesday night. We had church on Wednesday night. And I said, well, Jock won't be there. Because being in God's house was more important than being at ball practice. Now, I'll admit, church may not always be what it should be. And maybe they don't always do what they should do. But if you build your life and the life of your kids around the importance of being in God's house, you will have a better life. You will raise better kids. And if you invest your life and their lives in the house of God, you will have a better family. Why do you think God said, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? He said, bring them up the way they should grow. And they will not depart from it when they're old. God took Ezekiel to the house of God. There was coming out a trickle that kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper until it was a river too great to cross. What is God saying in all of that? He's saying, keep walking. Keep growing. Don't stop. Are you saved? Get baptized. Take the next step. Join the church. Are you filled with spirit? Are you tithing? Are you finding something of value that you can do? Well, I just, there's nothing I can do. You know what? You could be a greeter at the door. I wouldn't care if there's 15, 20 people back there welcoming everybody that come in. Shaking hands with them. But you need to understand the importance of being in God's house. Never stop growing. And if you think you have arrived... You're a fool. <laughs> Paul the Apostle said, he said, I count not myself to have apprehended or to attained. He said, I haven't arrived yet. But the one thing that I do, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Just keep, keep growing, keep moving. Now the first thing Ezekiel saw was just a trickle of water. That's your salvation. Take a drink. Then he got into water up to his ankles. He got his feet wet. Ephesians 6, Paul is talking about putting on the whole armor of God so you'll be able to stand. Because there's tough times going to come. You're going to get hit with some bad times. He said, you're going to need the whole armor of God if you're going to be able to stand against the evil that's coming. He said, verse 11, put on the armor of God uh, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, whether you like it or not, 
We have some spiritual wickedness in high places in this country today. And you better get ready and you better be prepared for evil days to come. There's some bad stuff coming down the road. And it's not going to be pretty. It's going to get worse before it gets better. He said, therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the evil day and having done all to stand. He said, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means get your feet wet. Get your feet in the water. What are you talking about, Mac? Go tell someone else what happened to you. You tell them how you got saved. You witness to them and introduce them to Jesus Christ. Now listen, he said, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. When you introduce someone to Jesus Christ, you have made peace with them. You're a peacemaker. You have introduced them. Now then, they are at peace with God, and God is at peace with them. The war is over. They're not warring against each other anymore. So you get saved. Get your feet wet. Get ankle deep in the water. Go tell somebody else. The woman at the well, she met Jesus. What was the first thing she did? She went and told others about Jesus. She went back to the old crowd that she had run with, that knew her for what she was. She was not a good woman. And she told them how she got saved. She said, you've got to come and see a man that told me all things. Well, he didn't tell her all things. He just told her a few things. Women exaggerate. <laughs> Men would never do that. Get your feet wet. Matthew, the apostle, was saved at the seat of customs. Do you know what the first thing he did? He prepared a big supper. And he invited all of his friends. And he told them and introduced them to Jesus. And this is where Jesus was accused of eating and drinking with sinners. Now, some of you have got friends that you've never told about Jesus. If they go to hell, are they going to consider you were a friend? If you're saved, get someone else saved. That's simple. Get your feet in the water. Are you breathing? So, number two, you're saved. Got your feet in the water. Don't stop. Get knee deep. Get your knees wet. What are you talking about now? Become a person of prayer. Get your knees wet. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In the Spirit, what does that mean? That means the times when you pray with groanings and utterings that no man can understand. Praying in the Spirit and watching with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then he said, pray for me. Now this is Paul. Pray for me that I will speak boldly about the mysteries of the gospel. You've got plenty to pray about. When Joe and I went into ministry... We didn't know anything about ministry. We were out in the country. Joe's daddy had opened a store out in the country between Logansport and Mansfield, Louisiana. We went down to visit him, and there was a little church building right there beside where he opened that store. We were interested. We went over and looked. The door was open. There were pews, pulpit, altar, piano, and we got to checking around. They were not having any services. Hadn't had services in a long time. 
I called, it was an Assembly of God church, I called the Assembly of God headquarters in Alexander, Louisiana. Talked to the superintendent, his name was Lowell Ashbrook. I talked to him, I told him about the church, where it was. I said, they're not having services, haven't had service in a long time, be hard if I go and preach. Now, I didn't know anything about ministry. I didn't know you're supposed to have a license, didn't know you're supposed to be ordained. I could not even legally perform a wedding. We started having church, and it started growing. Now, I was a welder. I worked at AMF Beard in Shreveport, Louisiana. And that fall, I quit my job. Now, I was making good money for the time and started to college. Church started growing and building filled up. First service we had there, there was five people. There was Tom Hatcher and his wife, I can't remember her name. The old couple, then their 70s, he was retired. And there was a, one woman with three kids. Five people. Church started growing. And uh, it was not easy. We soon ran out of money. But me and Tom Hatcher, the old man, we built two Sunday school. It was just one room. We built two Sunday school rooms on the back. Joe would teach Sunday school. She'd play the piano, and I would lead the singing, and I'd preach. Second church, I was still in college. The president of the college, Dr. Jimmy Thorpe, called me in his office one day. Now, I was pastoring an Assembly of God church in a Baptist college. <laughs> they thought I was a gift, but not necessarily from God. I challenged him on a lot of things. Right? I enjoyed myself. But he took a liking to me. <clears throat> he called me in his office one day and he said, Mac, we're getting up a bus trip to go to Jack Howe's pastor school. And I'd like for you to go. The tuition is $15 and we're all going to chip in $20, I think, to pay expenses for the bus. And I probably learned more that week in Jack Hiles Pastor School than I learned in all of the years I was in college because he taught practical ministry. And I praise God for Jack Hiles. He built a great church. He was a great man. That was in Logansport, Louisiana. We still have people there who remember us and stay in touch with us. We didn't know anything about ministry. But we knew we were supposed to be soul winners. And we knew that we had to know how to pray. We learned how to pray, how to believe God, to get answers to prayer. And God met all of our needs and he has blessed us with a river above and beyond anything you could ever ask or think. Too big to swim in. Now, you don't have to be in ministry to grow. Don't stop with just being saved. Don't stop with a trickle. Get your feet in the water, be a soul winner. Learn to get on your knees and how to pray. How to get answered to prayer. Uh, God wants to meet your needs. He wants to answer your prayer. And I just stand up here and say, come on in. The water's fine. Don't quit. Then he got into water up to his loins. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins gird about with truth. Having your loins gird about with truth. Loins represent your strength, your power. Gird up your loins with truth. Why? Because any athlete will tell you, when your legs are gone, you're finished. Builds your strength. What are you talking about, Mac? 
I'm talking about build your character. Build your integrity. Your honesty. Be a Christian who keeps his word. Pay your bills on time. You signed a contract that you would pay your bill uh, on the first of the month. You pay it on the first or before. If you pay it on the second, you're a liar. You're not a person of your word. You pay it a week late, you lose your reputation. You lose your character. Lose your integrity. Mac, I don't like that. I don't care whether you like it or not. I'm telling you how to be strong in the Lord so you will be able to stand in the evil day. I'm telling you how to be what you're supposed to be. Be a strong Christian. Gird up your loins. Let the world know I'm not just going to talk the talk. I'm not just going to say that I'm something that I'm really not living. I'm not going to just talk the talk. I'm going to walk the walk. Over and over, God says, gird up your loins. Joshua, gird up your loins. Be strong in the Lord. You've got a battle to face. Put on the whole armor of God and having your loins gird about with truth. This fake gospel that's so popular and being preached in so many circles today the product is not going to be strong Christians. And the first day that gets evil, they're going to crumble. There are multitudes of people who love God. They're saved and they know it. But they've never even gotten in water up to their ankles. Never witnessed anybody. All they've got is a trickle. They took a drink and that's as far as they went. And I just say, Come on in. The water is fine. Don't just be a Christian. Be a great Christian. Be faithful. Be a soul winner. Be a praying Christian. Be a tithing Christian. Be one who walks the walk. Remember this. The deeper you get in the water, the less of you that shows. And the more God can do because you are hidden and you bring him into view. The reason we don't serve God, reason we don't win souls, is because of the flesh. Spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. The reason we don't pray, reason we're not faithful, is because of the flesh. But the problem is, Many Christians are in churches that are nothing more than spiritual wading pools. They've never gone beyond anything but talking about salvation. They not even got their ankles in the water. Oh, I'm saved going to heaven when I die. But are you faithful? You never take a stand for God. You never witness to anybody. You're just a drip in a spiritual wading pool. You know, this building ought to be full every Sunday, standing room only. Do you realize we're one of the few churches around that's growing and prospering and doing well? But, yeah, go ahead and give yourself a hand. If every one of us brought someone to church next Sunday, somebody would have to stand up or sit on the floor. Wouldn't that be a disgrace? But we're already disgraceful. Let's just go ahead and finish the product. How many would mind sitting on the floor or standing up while somebody else? See, look around. When the offering was received a little bit ago, did you just give a trickle? Did anything less than one dime out of every dollar is less than gratitude. 
You come in, you drop your $5 bill in the offering tip. God and think you're doing him a favor. When you, st- I'm, I'm almost through, relax. When you stop giving to God in a trickle, God will stop giving a trickle back to you. God said he would multiply back to you whatever you give to him. If you give him nothing and he multiplies it back, you still got nothing. Jesus said it this way. With what measure you give, it will be measured back to you again. God uses the same measure to give to you that you use to give to him. Is your faithfulness just a trickle? You trickle in. If everything's fine, the weather's all right, you don't have anything else to do. If you feel like it. Paul said about the Macedonians, they first gave themselves to God. Did you know that's all God ever asked for? It's all he wants. It's just you. I want to tell you a story. It's not my story. I read this. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But it touched me. A man loved this woman. He constantly was asking her to marry him. He took care of her. He provided all of her needs. He was always there when she needed something. The problem was she was blind. And she always told him when he would ask her to marry him. She would say, I would marry you if I could see. But I can't see, so I can't marry you. One day, some eyes were made available. The operation was performed. It was obviously a success. When the bandages were taken off, she could see. And the first thing she saw standing in front of her was the man who had loved her and begged her to marry him. And she always told him, if I could see, I would marry you. She looked at him and she realized he was blind. Nothing but sockets. And she said, I can't marry you. You're blind. He said, before your eyes were yours, they were mine. Isn't that what Jesus did for us?